<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Sandy Monroe, the Acting Vice President of Student Affairs, and Tony Hawkins, Dean of Students for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, August the 6th, 2010 in Schliemann. Uh, both of them were at the atten attended the christening of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Dorothy C. Stratton on July 23rd. Thank you. We'll start with Tony. Tony, tell me a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents in the early years. You want dates and everything? <laughs> That's up to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was born March 21st, 1944. Uh, grew up in um, North Carolina. I lived in a little community called Montwood. Uh, and uh, went to college at Mars Hill College in the mountains of North Carolina. Followed my older brother there uh, after work. I had to work a year after high school before I went to Tell college. Tell us about high school. What was that like? Any student clubs and stuff that you were in? Uh, yes. Um, it's hard to remember all of them. It's been so long ago. But uh, I remember being in a couple of honors uh, clubs. Uh, part of the, uh, here it would be called the debris. I forget what mm -hmm. they called it then. But I know the title of it was the Hilltopper. And it was the, uh, the booklet with all the pictures of all the classes in it and everything. Uh, high school, it was, you know, this was in late 50s, early 60s. Graduated in 62. Um, rock and roll was big. Uh, rock and roll music was big at that point in time. And so we had a lot of sock hops. At, at, sure. And uh, that was our socializing. And I remember working with uh, students on the, uh, on the book, uh, like Debris, um, and we used to be able to play tricks on one another and would roll cars away from where someone had parked it. And back then there were no safety features. You could just put a car in, in neutral and push it anywhere you wanted to. <laughs> then we'd, we'd have fun with the person who couldn't find his or her car. Uh, high school was great. Then I went to college, Mars Hill College, and uh, was that near where you lived? Or? No, oh. it was about uh, six hours away okay. in the mountains. Small private uh, college, and uh, then after that, I taught high school English for two years in two different places, two different experiences altogether. First year was in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, students who, the, that I taught were from families who worked in some of the from the. Uh, mills there. Right. And one of them was um, a tire uh, manufacturer and uh, the high school we, that I was working with, you could smell the tires all day long, every day. Um, had some good experiences, had some anxious moments. Uh, first year of teaching is always more about learning than it is teaching, especially these high school kids whose parents would work different shifts and they didn't have much discipline at home. Second year went to West Jefferson High School, taught there, farming community. Uh, families were very close, just a, a different experience altogether. Those, those kids were great, uh, fun to work with. When I left they gave me a 22 uh, rifle, um, which was an outstanding gift. Oh, I would say. Uh, but they thought very that's, special of you. Well, that's part of that was part of their culture. Living right. in the mountains, hunting right. was a big, big deal for them. Right. And let's see. Then I got my master's degree at Appalachian State University in guidance counseling. Uh, worked in community college for three years after that in North Carolina, and uh, the master's program just whetted my appetite for more. Uh, education in, in what I was studying because I really enjoyed that experience. Um, so the, um, that in the back of my mind I always wanted a PhD and uh, during the master's program we studied from books written by uh, people who were here at Purdue. So I followed one of my friends up here who had already come to work on his PhD, um, signed up and thought I would get my PhD, go back to North Carolina and change the world, but I'm still here at mm -hmm. Purdue University. And, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Good. It's been when, great. Uh, were you, did you do any working, would you work while you're getting your PhD here? Or yes. Or an assistantship? And assistantship with the okay. uh, admissions office the first year, second year was financial aid. 
By the end of the second year, I'd finished all my coursework, but had not done the proposal uh, in uh, writing the dissertation. Uh, but I was fortunate in that uh, Beverly Stone hired me into the Dean of Students office that third year. So I worked full time and uh, worked on the PhD, and they were very supportive of my working on the PhD. Eventually got that done in 1979. So. Uh, the rest is history. And I continue to stay on, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, we'll talk Sandy. Go ahead. Please. I was um, born in, on June the 7th, 1953, in Seymour, Indiana. Okay. Um, born on a farm. Uh, grew up in a, a rural area as well with um, lots of my family in the, in the area. Um, Generations of my family grew up uh, in that in that area and immigrated to that area, had in, had immigrated to that area. So it was a uh, grew up in a pretty um, protected kind of in, in nourished environment there. Went to grade school at a parochial school there, and then uh, went on to a consolidated high school. Uh, had a good Talk experience. Talk about your high school days. Yeah, yeah, my high school days. Yeah, like Tony, I was involved in a lot of student activities. Right. Um, so much so that I got a warning when I went to college that not to get so involved in all the activities that I was involved in. Um, I was in, I remember being involved in the Girls Athletic Association, GAA, because there were no sports for girls. So right. I really, I liked being involved in sports, but that was my only outlet. The only was the avenue only, only avenue. My boys get tired of hearing me talk about that, but um, <laughs> so <laughs> it was. It was the only thing. I was involved in 4-H, which was something that was very much a part of growing up in the in the country. But I, I had been involved on our family farm and. That was uh, something that was a part of be growing up in, in the in the country, and I loved that le those leadership opportunities that I had. I today to this day, I think that's something that has helped me right. in the work that I do is the things that I learned in in 4-H. Um, I was involved in in the the yearbook as well. I was involved in student government. Um, I. Um, I, I, an honor society, a, you know, the Latin club. I mean, I, I very much enjoyed being sure. involved in, in high school, and I tried to be a very good student as well. Uh, right. So I, I, they were very busy years for me. Um, and but enjoyment. I, I really enjoyed it, and I still am friends with some of the people that were in my high school. Uh, that's still keep in touch with, okay. with some of those Tell people. Tell us about college. Now, where did you well, when I went to college, um, my family, growing on a farm, we – were stretched for resources, so I got a scholarship to uh, uh, our church-affiliated college, which was Concordia Teachers College in River Forest, Illinois. And uh, so I was really pleased to be able to have that opportunity to go sure. to college. And my first year um, was in um, it was in River Forest, and I had a, a good experience there. But it was a small college, and there you I was surprised that their resources were so stretched. The person that lived in the residence halls also did financial aid and was also the dean of students office and I didn't get as much attention as I thought I would get at a small school and it was a little bit disappointing for me and I came to visit some friends at other colleges and I saw that they had a lot bigger school experience and had gone having gone to a high school where I had a lot of opportunities sure. this consolidated high school I thought I wanted to have a bigger school feel so I came to Purdue in part because it had been a part of our um, culture at growing up on a farm uh, through extension and through 4-H, and also because I had such a nice experience here visiting my friends. Mm -hmm. um, so I transferred to Purdue my sophomore year and just had a terrific time uh, at Purdue and um, studied um, secondary education with a focus on history and, and uh, psychology. Um, and when I my junior year, I uh, was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with, with my life and uh, knew that I had enough credits to do the teaching piece but wasn't sure if that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I went to see a, a counselor um, to kind of help figure out what I wanted to do. And it was at that point that I decided, well, this counseling thing, I kind of like this, and if that's something that I could do to help other people, I would really like to do that. Um, I knew that I wanted to finish up and get my teaching license. I was so close. But I wanted to also um, figure out a way to, um, to enhance my teaching license if I decided I wanted to do teaching, 
because there was a tight teaching market back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, there was an opportunity through IU um, to teach on teach either in the inner cities or uh, to teach on a, a reservation. So I signed up to be an IU student while I was also a Purdue student, and I drove to Indiana University one day a week to enroll and enrolled in a, a program that allowed me to teach on the Navajo Indian Reservation for my student teaching. So my junior year, second semester, I spent a, a semester also being an IU student as well. And then my senior year, um, the end of my senior, well, I guess the end of my senior year, I was I enrolled full time as an IU student. Uh, and did my student teaching on the Navajo Indian Reservation at Cayenta, Arizona. And I, was in, I lived in a BIA school uh, with the children who were my students and was a student teacher uh, through Indiana University. So I had a nice experience, a very, uh, very enriching what experience. Age were the students? What, what, what? Uh, they were actually four through 16. Oh, wow. Um, they were, their parents were doing the best they could for their, their children. Um, many of the children lived in, uh, the families lived in hogans, one-room uh, uh, structures, and sometimes they had as many as 10 children, so they couldn't feed their children adequately or they were so far away uh, from schools at that time. That was, again, the 77. The school was right on the reservation? The school was right on the reservation. It was centrally located okay. so that they could bring the children there, uh, leave them for a week or two weeks or sometimes a month. And then the children, so they, stayed they stayed there. Mm -hmm. And they were not allowed to speak Navajo. They had to speak English. They had to learn, they had to also learn history, traditional history. I was primed to teach Navajo history because that was part of what I had done when I went to IU was to learn the Navajo history. But no, they needed to learn the traditional history so they could do well on SAT tests and succeed in our culture. So it was a very interesting experience for me. And on the teachers that I had that I, that were my supervising teachers were Cree and Cherokee and honestly they didn't have much respect for the Navajos which was really disappointing for me too. I learned a great deal about government, about politics, about um, the various tribes. And the various tribes and the Bureau of Indian Affairs and uh, the whole, the, the whole, whole thing. The whole thing. Right. And, yeah. and you, what was your housing facility like? I lived in the BIA dormitory. Oh, okay. So I had a little apartment where the children had a, a, an open dorm facility. So I was there the whole time. And it, it was there that really solidified that I wanted to get my counseling degree. My first day I was there, one of my students experienced a trauma. Her mother had been shot by her father, and she was in the car when it happened. So, yeah, yeah, I knew then that I, I wanted to really be able to help people individually, right. um, and so that really, I mean, that was a horrible experience. But that was one of those things where I knew that she was in my classroom and I couldn't do anything for her individually. Or, but I was certainly trying to be able to sure. be compassionate. You were there for her. Yeah, I was yeah. there for her right. on the side. Yeah. So then after after that, that, then I well I applied that that semester I applied to Purdue for their guidance and counseling program um, here came back and just came back in January um, and was uh, admitted to the program here while I was here um, I lived in the graduate graduate housing over uh, Young or Hawkins I mean and um, I applied through the office of the Dean of Students to be a grad resident uh, in one of the co-op houses and uh, so I lived in Shoe the following year I lived in Shoemaker Co-op as kind of a house mother they call it the grad resident the co-ops are self-governing so really I was there to be a live-in counselor and I really loved that job um, I bet. and I interfaced with the office of the Dean of Students so I met with the staff and the Dean of Students on a regular basis um, and um, it was through that experience that I got to know all of the staff in the Dean of Students office but especially um, Barbara Green um, Who was the Dean at that time? Was it, Barbara? it was Bev Stone Bev Stone, okay, mm -hmm. alright mm -hmm. okay. and 
I went to a ended up going to a con on a conference. Well, I went. I was looking for a job, but I ended up going on a conference called NAWDAC with them, and was out in the placement office, placement center, looking for jobs and interviewed with different folks and uh, got some offers and came back to the dean of students office and said what do you think of Dr. Dean Quilling and what do you think of these people at these different universities and they gave me some good feedback on those and then when I was ready to um, make a decision um, they said well we have an off opening here would you consider that and I said oh would I consider it absolutely <laughs> Sign I, applied, up. I applied for the job and was given an offer to work in the dean of students office and so I was um, given an opportunity to work in a very generalist um, role and have been there, there since. since. That's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about both of you going to the um, christening of the Dorothy Stratton. Do you want um, and also tell a little bit about your interaction. Both of you could in an interaction with Dorothy. I think this will be good for the archives material when she was here. Okay. She came here in 1986 um, um, to, return to, to, to return to Lafayette to okay. live with Helen Schleeman, okay. who had been her um, friend, long-term time friend. Uh, she moved in with Dorothy, Captain, retired Captain um, Sally Watlington, went to Connecticut to, to bring her back here to live with, with Helen Schleeman. Um, I got to know her by her, her attend by her being friends with Helen Schleeman. Um, Helen and Dorothy would attend things related to the office of the dean of students. Again, this NAWDAC professional conference, they would still continue to be involved in the profession, and Dorothy and Helen would attend those events. Um, there would be dinners after some of the professional meetings, and um, Helen and Dorothy would attend those meetings. Um, they were always up on current uh, events and re events related to higher education. Um, Dorothy, in particular, would would read things, and then she would always ask uh, what our opinions were or what our thoughts were. And she was the kind of person who was um, very much an advocate for students and supporting students. All right. She was up in years at that time in her life, wasn't she? When she came back, yes, was she in her seventies or eighties, maybe. It, she was in her 80s. Yeah, okay. yeah, in 83, she would have been 80, 82, or 82? 86. She came in 86, so okay. she would have been 85. Wow. Okay. Uh, and at the christening, were there any fam uh, family members? The, her nephew and niece were there, and her niece uh, has two daughters, and they have children and husbands, and the husband of her daughter, I mean her niece's uh, husband was there as well. So there, in total, there were 11 family members. Okay. All right. And I understand you both were in the VIP section. We were. Okay. Tell, oh, both of you comment on that. Who was, who was all included in that? The student who was there told me about, she was in the VIP section too. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a student, Laura Podgorski, who is uh, a living legacy of, of Dorothy and that there's a, a scholarship named after Dorothy Stratton. And uh, she was there. Um, there was a Sally Watlington, Betty Nelson, and Dick Nelson, who are considered the West Lafayette family of Dorothy, who helped take care of her after um, Dean Schleeman died. Uh, Tony Hawkins and his wife were there. Um, there were friends of Sally Wallington who who were in attendance. I happened to be sitting next to the uh, special projects manager of the ship. He was the person in charge of running the uh, construction of the ship, and he told me there were 900 people involved in actual construction of the ship, over 1,000 subcontractors. Um, it's taken him three years to build the ship. Um, there were people like that. There were people associated with the um, the, the legislators that were up on the, the platform. Um, Tony, do you know of others that yeah. were there? Grace Other? Lichtenberg, yeah. Linda Sorensen. Yeah, they were friends of Sally's, yeah. yeah. Mary well, Reese from Lafayette. Yeah. The Spars, the Spars were yes, the I Spars will. that had been um, in World War II. Um, were there. There were spars that were part of this group that comes back and has reunions uh, since since World War II. What about uh, Michelle Obama? Did you? She gave a speech. Did you get to meet her? 
we did not get to meet her. We got to be in her presence, but she was wonderful. She mentioned Purdue in her speech a couple of times. You mentioned Sally Lockett, too, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk, see what Tony, Tony, could you go ahead and talk a little bit about your reactions and reminiscences of it? Uh, and all, anything on Dorothy that you remember? You know, I, I, I do remember meeting Dorothy sure. uh, anytime there was a gathering. Uh, the, the women who had been deans before usually have some kind of a gathering and uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to some of those events and met Dorothy there. Um, and I, I didn't know all the history at that time. I did know that she was former dean of women. Sure. Uh, at that point in time, I did not know about SPARS and her role with that. And Helen Schleeman had been involved, um, so I, I knew a little bit of that history. Um, but it was a thrill for me to get to, to meet her and Helen Schleeman. And um, I remember Dorothy as being a quiet person, mm -hmm. very quiet. She was quiet. Um, so uh, she was, she just had a presence about her. You, you could tell that she could soak up information and just by listening. And um, that just, that was the impression that I got, that she was just very quiet, yeah. unassuming, mm -hmm. uh, not pretentious in any way. Um, but boy, you could tell that there was something special sure. about her. So I count myself fortunate to know the right people to get to know her and Helen. <laughs> And, uh, How did the, uh, let me ask this. How did the invitation come uh, to for the christening, and how did that come about? There hasn't been too much. You, we Sandy, knew about Sandy might know more about that than me. I was thrilled to get an invitation. Wasn't sure whether or not I should go, but I talked with Tom Robinson, our, our vice president for student services right. at that time. It, it was rumored sometime back that there was this thing in the works, but mm -hmm. nothing really, you know, since then. Well, uh, Tom, you wanna, and then I'll sure. come back to you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Sally Watlington knew that this was going to happen, and then some of us were contacted about s people that uh, would be co that would be appropriate to be invited, sure. and so we were asked to generate a list of individuals to send forward. So we sent your name forward, Tony. I'm glad. Thank That's you. Yeah. Did you know that uh, the Michelle Obama was going to be part of? We it? did. You did. Okay. Mm -hmm. We did. Did they have to do a security check? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. How, what, what did that entail? Um, giving our name and our birth date and our social security number um, and our home address. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Tony. Tell us about your reminiscence of the event. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take it to, on, on the day of the event. Okay. And Joyce and I wanted to make sure we got there on time. And uh, we, the closer we got, the more we, the more... Uh, police officers we began to see, uh, cars, people in uniform everywhere. Uh, and this was about five miles out, so we knew the security was tight. We had to go to a parking lot uh, that was uh, uh, meant for people to gather and then be bussed over a, a causeway in, into the island where the ship had been built. And um, as soon as we got to the parking lot, we knew that this was a bigger event than either of us thought it was going to be because there were tons of people there. I think about 3,500 had been invited. And, of course, you, you, you expect the security under those circumstances. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, when we got there, we did go through security. Uh, that wasn't too bad. It went very smoothly. They were very organized thought everything was set up just very nicely. We were uh, directed to go inside a tent and were told that our seats were up front and our seats had our names on them. And uh, before the ceremony began, this was about two hours before it started. We had, they wanted to get everybody in and seated. And uh, But they had U.S. Coast Guard band playing music. They had uh, a choral group that sang some beautiful music. Mm -hmm. um, it, the tent was interesting because I, I have pictures of to show how many people were actually there. And it was air conditioned. They had fans going on. If those in the back got the benefit of that, we were up front, uh, so it was a little warmer up front. But we knew that the people in the back wouldn't be able to hear as well as we could up front. <laughs> it's a trade-off. <laughs> yeah, it was a trade-off. Uh, I remember when. Uh, Michelle Obama was introduced. Uh, uh, the the 
the welcoming that people gave her was really outstanding. Everyone stood, clapped, and there was, uh, you know, some hooting and yelling, and <laughs> they were very excited to see her. And I How think did she arrive on the scene? Where after everybody, when did she come yeah, on board? I think she was already there, oh. but I'm, I know there was there a... There was a stage, though, wasn't there? Yes, there was, there was a stage. Okay. Um, and, and there had to have been a motorcade before as well as... And I saw the motorcade afterwards sure. as well. So, uh, But it was extremely well done. Mm -hmm. And uh, just everyone who spoke, and, and Michelle Obama herself... She's so personable when she, when she mm -hmm. speaks. It's like you're having a conversation with her. Sure. And uh, she really seemed to resonate with the story of Dorothy Stratton and the impact that that had on, on accessibility for women at that time to jobs that they had not been right. previously able to get. And what she did for that Coast Guard group. That's you know, right. And bringing yeah. it, bring it to, to fruition. That's right. right. Uh, before the speakers came on, I think there were a couple of vignettes that were shown and one of the spars said, looking back, that those are probably the greatest years of my mm -hmm. life. And uh, you could tell they were all excited to be there. The christening itself, she, the, plat the, the platform party was a little ways away from the ship. Then they, at the end, they escorted her to the ship and uh, had the bottle of champagne. She had to swing twice to get it broken. And I think it broke in the middle, and there was a lot of fizz <laughs> it even got on her. She, I, we saw her wiping. Having seen some those pictures during World War II when there were a lot of those going on and mm -hmm. some missed, you know, I know what yeah. you're saying, right? In the movies, in the news. Uh, after, <laughs> after all of that, there was a reception. Yeah, the reception was full. Uh, tons of food. I mean, th this was good food. And I mean, good food, yeah. seafood and uh, anything else. Uh, Where was the reception held, though? In another tent. Okay. Uh, close by. Close it, by. But it was huge. Mm -hmm. It was very huge. Uh, there was also some paraphernalia for sale uh, for, for the U.S. Coast Guard. And I bought a hat and a T-shirt with Dorothy Stratton, the cutter, on, on those items. Oh, nice. So, oh, that's yeah, great. Little mementos that we mm -hmm. could take sure. with us. But so pleased to have had the opportunity. It was just a great event. Terrific recognition of Dorothy mm -hmm. Stratton. And uh, Purdue. That's and, right. And absolutely. That's right. uh, it was good to have Purdue's name out there in that, right. in, in that manner. And uh, you could tell that everyone respected her and uh, knew that she had done something special. She would never probably no. claim to have no. done anything that special. Might have a special. problem getting her there and you know, knowing <laughs> yeah. her as reserved as she was. Well, that's the sad part. It, it would have been great if she could have known that mm -hmm. this was in, in was her in honor. Works, that's yeah, right. but yeah. I, I'm sure it meant the world to her family. Right. Did any of the spars uh, speak at all? Were they any of, any of them part of the program? Any people? Or I don't they were remember just in the audience? They were not, but okay. there were programs before. Right. Uh, for them on Thursday, there was a luncheon oh. for them. Oh, okay. And so there was an opportunity for them to be recognized. And then each of the spars from World War II got an opportunity to have their picture taken with Michelle Obama. And uh, oh, that's very. That nice. was very nice. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sandy tells me that the ship will not be. This is the christening, but uh, the commissioning will be in February of 2012. Okay. Do morning. they do the finishing down there? I mean, the sh uh, the ship and everything will be finished down there, or I'm you know, unclear about okay. that. I I think it goes to Alameda, uh, but I'm not sure. I have no idea. I don't know okay. for sure. Okay. But I understand it's a good The exterior good was done, but yeah. they had to work on the interior. It becomes right. the Coast Guard ship now. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. turns right. over to Coast yeah. Guard. And it was much larger. The, the ship was much larger than I thought it would be. Um, I have one picture that shows another ship in the background, and it's very small. I thought it was big, but it's very small compared to the, to the Stratton yeah. Cutter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, d uh, Sandy... You were saying, what was the, about how many people, or what was the size of the ship? Did it's you 418 that? feet, and it berths 148 people. It has a flight deck for uh, helicopters and other uh, unmanned security defense weapons. So it's a, it's a huge cutter. Right. Uh, let me ask you this. From the shipyard and to where you were staying, was that a bit of a distance? or It was, uh, maybe okay. 10 miles, Okay. Uh, 9 or 10 miles. Okay, okay. Any uh, anything else that you can think of that you'd like to share with it? 
I just remember Joyce and I talking about it afterwards and, and just taking, uh, taking stock of the fact that it was a big event. And it's something that I'm very glad that uh, we had that opportunity to go to. Right. What a great, a great mm -hmm. thing. Sandy? Um, for me, I, I think it was a, a, a reminder of what an impact one person can have. Um, and Dorothy was someone who um, was always an advocate and a supporter of people. And she did that here at Purdue. She also did it for the Coast Guard and her impact and her quiet deeds really did have an impact and to see somebody having that kind of impact and now to have a Coast Guard cutter named it's in her wonderful. honor is really remarkable and yeah. it brings great honor to her to her family and to Purdue. Do you know how this came about that they happened to name it for her? Does anybody is anything said on that or or not or you don't know? I think that was something that the Coast Guard maybe they they may have been involved Coast with Guard it probably did. then. Yeah, but it's just it's just a real coup. It really, really is. Nice. It's yeah. very wonderful. And Sandy, I'm not sure, but I, I, this may be just one of one of three named after a woman. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's not not many that are not named. many ships yeah. with yeah. And it's the first co ship that a woman a, a first lady has right has christened mm -hmm. so that makes yeah. it very special as well yeah. very good anything that, that I forgot to ask uh, that you the like only to... other thing we were all conscious of the fact that we were going down at, at a time when all attention was on the oil spill uh, in the Gulf so we we were looking to see evidence of that but we saw more evidence of Katrina than than uh, of the oil spill um, where we were staying in uh, in our hotel, we, we were about 20 miles out, and uh, the beaches were beautiful. They were they were clear. They had great sand. Didn't see any evidence of oil, but there were some news people on the beach. But the beach didn't have many tourists at all. Uh, and driving along the highway, we could see plot after plot where driveways uh, were still intact, but there were no homes there. So many that's, of those that's homes. That's Katrina. Got, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. So that's the only other thing that I could add to right, the story. That, that the the oil a, spill was a historical event, too, but not in the way we wanted. <laughs> I think one of the things that's important, Dorothy was always an advocate for women, and one of the things that, um, so this is certainly something that highlights women in the military. That's one of the things that uh, Michelle Obama wanted to mention also, was that this she is a supporter of military families. Um, the other thing is that Michelle mentioned too is that Dorothy, um, in her um, recruiting of women in the military, is that she also sought to recruit um, m minority women into the military too, and that was something that was kind of cutting edge as well. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, so yes. Dorothy was really out there on the edge, but in a uh, in a persuasive kind of way, and that was another piece that Michelle Obama highlighted, and I think is important to for us to mention. Oh yes, too. Very. Key. Uh, the more things that we can that we can add to the legacy that Dorothy left mm -hmm, is important. I mm -hmm, think is important mm -hmm. for future researchers and things of that that, That's of that right. nature too. And to think that this was in the 1940s for her to be doing that. The the piece that I left for you talks about Dorothy talk Dorothy um, referencing that the women who were spars. When I talked with the spars, they mentioned to me that they were hired first to come in and free up the men so they could go to fight the battle. And so some of the things that they did is they took over the office jobs or they took over jobs as drivers. And, um, and those were jobs that people thought, oh, yeah, women can handle this. But then as, they, as the men continued to leave and there were other jobs that were left, the women were allowed to do things like rig parachutes, or take on jobs as in electronics or in mechanics area, and people were surprised that they could handle those jobs. But the women continued to meet and exceed the expectations, and so they were given a chance to do more and more. And so I think this set the precedent for women to be in the military. One of the things that one of the, I just want to share this, the, the women in the spars that uh, I talked to were so, so full of life, and they were beyond their 80s, but they loved this part of their of their early life. 
and they never forgot they, they never forgot. forgotten it and some of them took advantage of the fact that they were driving for officers in the military and they were talking about when they first started they were only allowed to stay in the 48 states you know if they were driving for people they were only allowed to be assigned in the first 48 then the, the opportunities were al- opened up to Alaska and Hawaii well some of these young women knew that Hawaii would be a great place to be assigned. So while they're driving, they're talking about, I'd really like to go to Hawaii. You think I could get assigned to Hawaii? So here they're 19 and 20 year olds trying to get assignments to be driving around in Hawaii. And you know, they got assigned. <laughs> so that was a nice story that I heard. <laughs> That's very good, yeah. Tony, and, okay. Thank you very much, Tony. And so I really appreciate